I'm very honored and really delighted to be hosting this conversation, and it will be an interactive conversation between you, me, and Leos Carox, the director of Holy Motors, and four other features. And just, um, you know, I, I realize maybe all of his films haven't been seen in India, so I just want to remind you a little bit of his career. Uh, Leos made his debut with a film called Boy Meets Girl in 1984, a wonderful widescreen black and white film that instantly made him a filmmaker that everyone was interested in. It was followed by Bad Blood in 1986, by The Lovers uh, on the Bridge, Les Amants de Pont-Neuf in 1991, by Pola X in 1999, and by Holy Motors in 2012, which for many people, including myself, was the best film of the year. Please welcome Leos Carax. <laughs> hmm. Holy Motors, he's <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> I'm sure it's just temporary. Uh, why do you tell us something about him? <sighs> um, yeah, maybe I can speak about him in his absence because <laughs> I think he probably wouldn't want me to wax uh, about him. But, you know, he's one of these filmmakers who embraces cinema and all its, all its joy and its expressiveness. He uses color and music and widescreen and sound. Um, he deals with lovers who are passionately driven. Um, this has been a constant theme. Um, in fact, a retrospective that's happening soon in Toronto is it's titled Boy Meets Girl, and it was more or less the subject of the first three films. The settings changed, the circumstances changed, but they were about, you know, insatiable, fatalistic love affairs between, often involving three people, either two men and one woman, or one, uh, uh, one man and two women. Um, so he's, he's a real romantic, and he sees it in cinematic terms. Uh, the films are filled with emotional scenes, with uh, choreographed scenes with things that are managed to be both heightened theatrically and yet strangely real. I think he, he's one of these people who makes cinema that transports you into another realm. Speaking of transporting, please welcome Leos <laughs> Karak. Please come back. <laughs> I just told people, uh, give them a brief uh, rundown of your films, since Boy Meets Girl. Oh, and I know that uh, Holy Motors screened at the festival last year, was wonderfully well received. Um, can you tell us a bit about how that film in particular came about, and maybe we can then broaden it out to the rest of your career? Well, I hadn't made a film for ten years, and. I was trying to make films, uh, mostly films outside of France. I mean, they were all projects outside of France, in, in Russia, or America, or in London. Uh, they were bigger projects, um, and I couldn't make them, so I decided I had to make a film right now. And to do that, it had to be in Paris, a cheap film in Paris. Um, with no problems with money or casting. So I decided to shoot a small film and video with this actor, Denis Lavant, uh, who I already knew. Uh, we had made a few films together. And the whole idea came very fast, and we shot it pretty fast. I'm surprised you say it's, it's so cheap, because it feels like almost an epic film. I mean, it takes place in possibly, you can correct me, 10 or 12 separate vignettes in different locations. Some of it seems to involve CGI and special effects. There's a lot of uh, makeups and setups, I would think. How did, how did, you, did, you, how did you kind of pre-plan this? Was it carefully worked out so that you could shoot a minimum number of days? And um, well that's basically the only good thing about digital. Um, <laughs> The other good, film, the good thing about digital for me is that since I shoot in digital, because I had made a short film in, in Japan a few years before in digital, right. uh, I don't watch the dailies anymore. So I go much faster because I used to remake everything. I used to shoot and then 
they said I have to remake this scene when I was shooting on film. So I went, you know, my shooting on film were getting longer and longer. And now with digital, they're getting shorter and shorter. Um, so that's how we were able to do it. And did you work from like a carefully prepared script? I mean, each segment, there's a spontaneity about the film that is totally infectious, but of course, I'm sure it was very carefully planned. It's not, it's not exactly dialogue heavy, but each sequence has its own feeling, style, mm. sense of I always, I always have a script. Um, basically, you always need a script because you're not going to get money without scripts. Um, then, uh, you know, I, I, I rework every day before shooting and during shooting and also editing because this film is probably the film that changed the most at the editing stage more than my other films. Uh -huh. um, so, um, And you ask a lot of Denis Levant. Uh, when we were talking before you said that uh, you felt he'd, he'd become a much, not a much better actor, but a, an actor who was able to take on something this demanding. Very few actors could take that on. Well, you know, we met when we were, we're the same age, we're the same age and the same size. And we met when we were 20, 20, <laughs> 21, I forgot. Um, and we made three films together and the, in the 80s. Um, but we don't know each other. I mean, I've never had dinner with him or, uh, you know, he's a neighbor now. He lives in my neighborhood. So <laughs> if we see each other in the streets, we say hello, but we're not friends, let's say. And um, each film, I, when, I, when I made my first film, after the film, I, I thought I didn't use him right because he's very physical and I had to use him like a sculpture but it, n not moving enough and not so I wrote uh, I imagine a second film for him and each film it's been like that it's like you know and at the same time he he's been he he's aged and um I feel the beginning he was from the beginning an interesting actor but limited and now I feel he's unlimited he could play anything did did you re do you rehearse these scenes with him? So they seem very worked out, um, especially the ones involving musical numbers like uh, accordion procession. Um, is that a style you like to like to rehearse, or do you think it kind of kills the feeling? Mm -hmm. I only I never rehearse um, normal scenes, let's say, but I always rehearse in each film I've made. I always put in physical stuff and musical stuff, so yeah. that has to be rehearsed. You know, there's dance, or if Denis has to jump from an airplane, or if he has to, yeah, if he has to dance or do acrobatics, uh, that we rehearse. So in this film, it was, and whatever he does, I do myself. So we both had to learn accordion, um, huh. and he had to rehearse the scene. Um, the motion capture scene, of course. The yeah, uh, I, for, I don't know how many people have seen this. I won't get too specific, but there's the motion capture is the, I said CGI, that may be incorrect. How is that done? I mean, they, be, he, they dematerialize from being human into essentially figures of light that intersect. Yeah, and so it's, it's not at all, I mean, we didn't do it at realistically at all. Um, we, we use black light and little, you know, little white spots. Um, so, but it is, I mean, basically it is motion capture. Uh -huh. And motion capture, um, that's why I showed in the film, I don't know if people saw the film, but it starts with a few images of 19, 19th century uh, chronophotography by, by Marais. Right. Uh, where you see um, people, a little child running, or I mean, the first images of cinema in history, yeah. and that was already motion capture. That's what cinema is: motion capture or emotion capture. And Marais was the scientist who also did these uh, elect electrical experiments, right? On 
uh, wiring people up and then taking photographs of them in extreme facial expressions, etc. I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah. They um, were two, they were at the same time Marais and Muybridge. Muybridge was yes. more horses and animals <laughs> and Marais and was athletes. more yeah. Uh, men. Yeah. Um, I know that um, in, the, in the film, uh, Lovers on the Bridge, which I think is shot almost entirely on sets, there might have been a little bit of location on the subway platforms, but there's a spectacular sequence in which, um, I don't know if it's meant to be Bastille Day, but there's fireworks going off extraordinarily on the skyline of Paris while the main characters are doing a sort of choreographed ballet or action in, for in the foreground. That must have been an unbelievable undertaking. Uh, do you enjoy working on sets and using that level of artifice? Um. Yes. Um, I mean, if I had more money, I would, you know, I would do everything. Uh, on sets, uh, I'm not. I'm not good with real stuff. Um, that's why I like to shoot at night. You know, at night you have to recreate everything. Night, even night in Paris, and night in the city, it's like a studio. You have to. You have to light it. Yeah, um, but this film is particular because it was. It wasn't meant to be a set. It was a huge bridge in Paris, and we, I thought we were going to shoot on the real bridge. But it was not possible, so we had to to rebuild this neighborhood of Paris and the countryside. Ah. I'm wondering if um, we could have some conversation with the audience. Uh, are there there, sir? Uh, sorry, why was it not possible to shoot directly on uh, Le Pont Nord? Did uh, do you want me to repeat the question? Why was it not possible to shoot yeah, he just mentioned it on the Pont Neuf? Because it's from the local yeah, the Pont Neuf is very central, and we would have blocked all Paris, you know, traffic, and so they they didn't want that. It's a secret, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I changed my name when I was thirteen years old, so it, it has nothing to do. I didn't know I would make films. I was not interested in cinema. Uh. So it has nothing to do with the Oscars, as people ask me sometimes. In New York, someone asked me if it was an anagram. Leo's Cox was an anagram of oral sex. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know much about oral sex at 13 years old, so <laughs> I can't answer. But you knew about anagrams. <laughs> um. And uh, the lead character that Denis Lavant plays in Holy Motors is named Monsieur Oscar. Uh, many critics, I mean, see the film as not autobiographical, but yourself as, as a theatrical person who's, who he is. A, Monsieur Oscar is standing in for all the possibilities of cinema. Well, I always gave Denis either my name, Alex, which is my real name, um, and this time Oscar. Um, um, I don't know what it says. I mean, I'm, I don't have much imagination. That's for sure. Really? So, um, especially with names, they, in my films, people always have the same names. They always call Alex and Theo and Florence and Anna, and I keep using the same names. But I don't know really what it means. Yeah. Um, you say that you. You, you didn't come to you didn't change your name because you were interested in cinema and know that you were going to be a director, which is very understandable at 13. Uh, but when did you have an interest in cinema? Later in high school or college? Because you also were a critic for a while. I, um, as a kid, I, I, I liked cinema like every kid. You know, I, I went to see films, but mostly for actors. You know, I would see every Charles Brunson film or every Marilyn Monroe film. Or right. Um, and I discovered cinema, I discovered that there was someone behind the film uh, late um, when I finished school, when I was 16. I, I moved to Paris and I didn't know anybody in the city, so I, I would go to the, to the movies. And that's when I understood this, ha there has to be someone be behind the film, 
usually a man. Now there are more women, but at the time there were very few women making films. Usually a man filming a woman, and that's what I wanted to do. Do you, do you still go to movies? Do you kind of follow n new films, the scene? No. No. No? No. I saw lots of films at that time, from maybe 16 to 24. I, I, I saw lots of you know, silent films, Russian films, American films, up to the new wave films. Um, and when I finished my second film, I decided I had seen enough. Yeah. <coughs> I try to make films, uh, mostly. But I also, I travel, um, I read, I write. Uh, I fall in love, or I fall sick. Um, I do what everybody does. Um, but. You know, even if I had, didn't have any trouble with finding money, I don't think I would have made s many films. Uh, maybe a, a few more, but not that many more. I have to feel, when, if I make a film, that I'm not exactly the same person as, you know, the, the, the guy who did the film before. I, have to f that, I think that's what Holy Motors is about, it, you know, how to, how to reinvent yourself. I mean, I know that in some of the, p you know, stretches between features, you've made shorts. You know, contributed to the anthology Tokyo, um, and there are other shorts, none of which I've seen, and actually never seen them playing anywhere. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the the shorts, because Holy Motors is also, I mean, you can see it as a, a succession of shorts, each film having a s each chapter sequence having a distinct frame of reference. Mm. I don't think I've made any good shorts uh, except Tokyo. I like Tokyo. I mean, my, my, my segment in Tokyo. Uh, but the other shorts were like, I was asked, you know, for, and I made what I, whatever I could, but they were not very interesting. They, so you didn't miss much. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see shorts as like, you know, the way a, a painter will do drawings as a study, or they haven't. Not for me, because. Yeah. Um, there's something in cinema about because it maybe because I started young and I yeah. you know when I made my first film I had never seen a camera before uh, and I didn't study film I didn't go on shoots yeah. um, so from the beginning it was kind of a bluff you know to make a film to go see people and say give me money I know I know how to make films and it's always been like that in my mind it's like right. um, I don't feel like I'm a filmmaker uh, someone who sometimes makes films and each time it's like the first one and the last one. So it's, sh in, that, in these terms, short films are not ex exciting for me. I know that, I, I read in an interview you did, you, I thought this was in, intriguing that, I think it was in reference to Holy Motors in particular, but in general that often you just start with one image and that in Holy Motors you have the image of this old woman or this you were drawn to the spectacle of these very old people who beg on the bridges in Paris, and that from that, shall we say, poetic image grew the whole film, or at least ignited the whole film. Yeah, usually it's, um, well, I'm not a storyteller, so I don't, you know, I, so I start with one or two images uh, and one or two feelings, and then I try to to mix or to edit these feelings and these images together. Uh, in Holy Motors, it was this old woman banging on the bridge with her back completely bent. And of course, these cars, these limousines, putting them together. Um, and the feelings, obviously, they were, they all, I think in each of my films, there are two feelings that I kind of opposed. In this film, it was, um, what we call in French uh, la fatigue d'être soi, which is being tired of being yourself or being tired of being oneself, you know. Yeah. And an opposite feeling, which is this need I talked about, about the need to reinvent yourself. You know, men, people have to reinvent themselves it's, um, and in order to survive. And how do you do that? Do you have the courage and the strength to do it? Can you do it? 
Um, so these so the two feelings for this film. I mean, in in some of the earlier films, it seems like the uh, what's the, the the impetus to change yourself is love. To have an obsessive love changes you. It, it changes your daily life. It changes your actions towards other people. Would that be fair to say that? Yeah, yeah, it's a romantic vision of sorts, but I think yeah. The, the I mean, the three films were made in the eighties, uh, like a trilogy, you know. Uh, in each of these films, Denis Levant, the actor, is called Alex, and each time he meets a girl. Yeah, the first one is called Boy Meets Girl, but the, they all could have been called Boy Meets Girl. So um, yeah, it's always this need, you know, to to reinvent yourself and to go faster, to be lighter, not to yeah. be heavy, that you look you know, through, through a woman, through love, you think you're going to escape gravity. <laughs> um, but what happens when you fall back, when, you know? Uh, so that's what these films are about. One of your films, only one, is based on a literary source, and an, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, a sort of major literary source in it's Herman Melville's uh, Tipe. What drew you, sorry, not TP, uh Pierre. Pierre, right. What drew you to a 19th century novel? Uh, was it an image that came out of the novel, for example, that you thought, I can, I can, I can, I, I get that? In this case, it was a novel I read when I was younger, when I was, when I arrived in Paris. It, some guy gave me this novel um, called Pierre, or The Ambiguities. Um, so it's the novel Herman, Herman Melville wrote after Moby Dick. And because Moby Dick was such a failure, as nobody read it. He decided he would write something popular, and he wrote Pierre, which was a bigger failure. <laughs> uh, and then he stopped writing for years. Um, and when I read this book at 19 years old, I thought, this is my book. You know, this is a, like a brother. Um, it has every question, I think, that a young man should ask himself. It's like, you know, like Hamlet or... Um, so I thought I would never make a film because you shouldn't make films out of important books. But after Lovers on the Bridge, Les Amants du Pont-Neuf, I, I didn't make films for 10 years and I decided I should... I should if it was taboo, I should do it. Um, the only fear I had was I, I would never find the boy and the girl, but I did, and I, and I made the film. Um, it's also a film about, and the book, I assume, same, about an obsessive love, in fact, a quite mad love, a love that focuses on the most unlikely object. <coughs> And goes to the most extreme. It's a um, brother sister story, let's say. Um, yeah. Because you see sister in French is sir, and you say I'm sir, like soul sister. Um, huh. And to me, sir yeah. in French is the most beautiful word. It's very close, close to heart, which is cœur. Yeah. So yeah. You have cœur et sœur, l'âme sœur, soul sister. Um, but you know, I made the film, and as the book, nobody went to see the film. So it was uh, even with that cast, it's, it, it seemed like a high-profile project. <coughs> you know, a literary source, Catherine Deneuve, above the line. Uh, um, it's tough, I know. I mean. Good films get it's lost between the cracks. They get badly marketed. It must be. I think it was. Um, I don't. I've never seen it. I never see my films again. So I, I just have an image of my films in my head. But I respect the film. Um, maybe it was too dark. I don't know. Do you th do you think about? I mean, the audience and audience when you make your films. I mean. In a, in a way beyond what you have to think about to raise the money? Uh, 
Yes and no. I don't. I don't. I mean, the audience until a certain point is me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then it becomes others because when you have to find money, of course. So let's say for Holy Motors, they ask, you know, what's this film about? Why should we give you money? And if I say it's a film about the experience of being alive today, they won't give me any, any money. Yes. But if I say, you know, there are limousines and beautiful women and monkeys, <laughs> then they give the money. And, um, so true. <laughs> so you, and then, of course, when you edit, you start to think about audience because you, I don't edit alone. I edit with an editor, the same editor, for a long time. And if she doesn't understand something or if she doesn't feel what I'm feeling, it questions, you know, it's yeah. the first, second audience, is the editor. And then, of course, you show the film, and suddenly the public exists. <laughs> Did I, I think that, I mean, for me, and I'll speak, I would assume for a lot of people, it's a, it's a very funny film. I mean, it's, it's, it's witty, <coughs> and it's outright. There are laughs in that film, and which I <coughs> really say is true of the other films. Did you have in mind to, to <laughs> I guess, to use humor in, in the more provo as a part of the provocative nature of the film because there's something anarchistic about it. And humor I is think in, in some way I hope there's humor in each of my films but maybe it didn't show. Um, but the experience of making this little film in Japan ah. um, in Tokyo um, maybe gave me more freedom because um, it was a 40 minutes uh, of this character that's also in Holy Motors called Merde. He's called Monsieur Merde, Mr. Shit. Um, and with this character, me, but also the actor Denis Levant, we had such a feeling of <coughs> freedom yeah. and jubilation, you know, um, that I think it, it went into Holy Motors also. The, what, what, can I ask you a bit about like the atmosphere on your sets with Holy Motors? Was it, was it fun to shoot or were you just having to work so hard that it... And I'm picking up on what you say about a kind of lightness, a joy. Because it comes through that way. Um, you no, know, Holy Motors I would say was a... Probably my easiest shoot. I, sh I chose only young people in the crew, ah. um, and I was lucky. Uh, they were. It was a very good crew. Um, but in each films, even before that, I always make sure that in the film there's a for the actors there's a there's something they can. There's joy, you know, the, that's why there's always a musical scene or an action scene mm -hmm. or something that has to do with physical stuff, you know, where actors have to prepare themselves, rehearse, and it's a way, even if they, for the part, they go down, for some, like Lovers on the Bridge was very hard for the two actors, but they knew they had to dance at some point yeah. and yeah. do physical stuff, you know, water ski or whatever, and uh, so it's, it's, it's good. It's also, I mean, it's, it's so much at the root of cinema. I mean, so many films are so kind of straight about that, right? And early cinema, like Melies, I mean, there were, there were gags, there was vaudeville, there was all the things that went before cinema that were drawn on. And we were talking earlier about Denis coming out of street theater and being sort of a circus guy, you know, having the skills of a circus guy. Play is such an important word in art. Yeah, I think we forgot how much s all that cinema is capable of, you know. C cinema is amazing, you can do anything. Uh, and we tend to forget that because we're trying to tell a story. Um, whereas in the beginning of cinema, this is why I'm so attached to, to the silent period of cinema. Yeah. The freedom was complete. Um, and I think that's, you know, cinema also has to reinvent itself. Uh, all the time, uh, because you know nobody. You know the first image is projected. We're a train coming into a station, and 
So people were afraid of the train. But that th this power gets lost, of course. Nobody's afraid anymore of a train coming into a station on the screen. So you have to reinvent this miracle yeah. of cinema. Every generation has to reinvent it through techniques and through yeah. imagination and vision. And there are even more techniques available. You know, you mentioned train. It reminds me of Orson Welles always said that cinema was the biggest train set any kid could play with. Um, and maybe he's a filmmaker that's close to your heart because he's another filmmaker that also said you have to put everything into a movie. Everything you think about you put into a movie. Don't say, don't edit yourself, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, was th I mean, here in India, there was a filmmaker called Guru Dutt. Oh, Guru Dutt. How you say? Guru Dutt. Dutt. Guru Dutt. Yeah, great filmmaker. Um, who had this imagination and, and, and freedom. Uh, so, you know, it's, that's what cinema is made of. Uh, are there other Indian filmmakers, just for our audience here, that you've like to know? Do you see us? I, I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Any Bollywood? <laughs> I know Guru Dutt. That's, okay, okay. that's it. <laughs> Who also made a limited number of films. I think he made like nine, ten films in ten years. So he had a very short career. But, but he died very young. Full he died young, yeah. yeah. Some com comments from the audience? Yes, yeah. Yeah. sir, again. Who are your favorite French directors? Favorite French directors. Ah, they're dead. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, as I said, I saw so many films when I started making films. I started making films as I, I was discovering cinema. And there's so many directors I, uh, that I feel grateful to. You know, it was a miracle for me to discover cinema. I thought this is a... I see it as an island, so this is the place I want to live in, this island. It's an island where you can see life and death and love, but from a different point of view, from different angles. So, I wouldn't, if I give one name, I, I, it would be too sad for the other names, but there are many, many <coughs> French and not French directors. I, I'm grateful. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that I imagined it so fast um, that when we started to edit it, um, in my mind the, the film was organic, but it became like a series of sketch, which it shouldn't be. So it took a long time to find, you know, that. And, and I did what a, a very rarely di do with uh, the editing, I, I, I really changed, you know, scenes, places. Um, like the, or the order of the? The order of scenes, scenes uh, of sequences. Um, I cut out more than usual, maybe. Um, I love editing, so it's, no, you know, I could edit a film all my life. I, uh, I only yeah. stop because producers or you know, want the film to be ready, but so the film as it is, is the film that was ready for Cannes a year ago. Um, but, um, and yeah, probably we, that's what I was saying with discovering the public as you edit is you think, you know, how long can you expect the public not to know anything about what they're seeing, not to understand, you know, to wonder where they're going. So I thought they could wander for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, what was the other question? Uh, I, I, I'll try to paraphrase. I think it was what next? basically up until Holy Motors, you, there was a kind of recurrent theme, the boy meets girl theme. But Holy Motors is really, you went off in a new direction and you talked about reinventing yourself and perhaps the question is, how does Holy Motors represent a reinvention for you? And, and does it, in fact, as you look forward, is it a kind of watershed? Uh, it feels like such a break-loose film. As well, now I'm, 
you know, I'm in the position of someone who finished a film, which is not a good position, um, because um, when you finish a film, there's emptiness and there's a dis disappointment. So you have to go over that and move on to something new. To move on to something new, you have to experience something new. As I said, I don't want to be the same person, which is a, you know, which is maybe impossible not to be the same person. But I, I have to think of myself as become, becoming something else, and it's only through experience and and traveling and meeting that this will happen. So I have no idea now what I will do next. I, I don't know. Hopefully, everything is related. Uh, you know, you try to, in making a film is inventing a world. So you feel you have a project. When you feel you have in this world you invent, invented is coherent in itself. It doesn't mean it's coherent with reality, but it has its, its own reality. Uh, that's when I can start, you know, I can say, okay, I want to start making this film. I think I have. Um, but the coherence or uh, the relations between the sequences or the characters he plays are, of course, um, very intimate. I mean, you know, they're not, uh, he's not, people ask me, does he age? Is there a chronicle, you know, because he's some, or is it, I don't know what. Um, it's nothing like that. It's, um, I mean, the, the, the constant is that it's one day, right? I mean, it starts in the morning and ends, you feel, at around midnight. A long day's work, long day's journey into night. <laughs> so yeah, that must that have driven it. Some of, the, some of the sequences are more nocturnal, just more interior, uh, you know. But I, I knew also, because when I decided I, I wanted to make a film right away, um, and I wanted the whole spectrum of, you know, what this experience I was ta talking about, you know, the experience of being alive. Th you know, I, I can't make a film. If I had, if I invented this job for Mr. Oscar, where he goes from one life to the other, um, if I didn't do that, I would, you know, in a classical narration, I would need flashbacks. If, I, if the character was a butcher or a, a doctor or whatever, you know, I would need flashbacks, see him younger. I can't do that. I don't know how to do it. So I imagine this world where in one day you could see what, uh, my, I mean, my, and my feeling of what it is, the life experience, you know, um, all in one day. Hmm. I think it's simpler than that. It's... Um, I mean, everything you make is from your limitations. So I'm not a storyteller, so I, I have to... I would love to be, you know, I would love to be Hitchcock, let's say. Uh, but I'm not. Um, and even Hitchcock, in a way, is not a storyteller. He's much more, you know, a poet than a storyteller. Um, that's why it's always very hard to, to say what a film is about. Um, I think, you know, Birds by Hitchcock is not a film about birds. Um, so the, the storytelling idea, the idea that, you know, um, we are, I mean, I love stories, I love, um, but stories can be many things, you know. Um, so, because I don't have that gift of storytelling, I have to find other ways of telling my stories. I have no idea. I, um, as I say, each film is trying to invent a world of its own. So you go, of course, in, you know, you go from this world to the... You have to invent the colors the, of the costumes. You have to invent the makeup, you have to invent everything, the way that people talk and walk and move. Right. And, um, so, yeah, I don't know if I answer that. That's what I can say. Okay. 
Um, well, this film was extreme. It was three years, but it was not three years of shooting. It was over three years. We shot a lot. We shot, I think, 50, more than 50 weeks, but it, and three times. In this case, it's very hard because it's not just the shooting. It's out the life, you know, for, for the actors, or for the team to be, uh, you know, to be suspended for three years is a very long time. Uh, but on a shoot, um, well, if you can't do that, if you can't, you know, you know, the director, if you can't bring people together uh, into this tunnel, um, so how do you do that? I don't really know. Uh, you find out the first day you start to make your first film, if you can do it or not. I didn't know when I started. Uh, <coughs> and it's not always always easy. Um, but you have, I mean, cinema is about meeting the right people. You know, you cannot make cinema alone. Uh, it's not painting, it's not writing. Uh, so you need at least two, three people, you know. Usually a producer, an actress, and a director of photography. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're not alone. Um, but you, you have to have people, you know. <coughs> that w this is what was so great with these young people in, in this last crew right, on Holy Murders. You have to feel that the people who are working with you are really living an experience. That they they're really gaining. They really, you know, the film is um, helping them in a way. So if you feel that, that's how it. That's the same with casting. If you if you hesitate between two actors, you should take the one for who the film is going to be the most important in his life. Yeah. Uh. <coughs> um. I would say that all of your films are be beautifully <coughs> shot, uh, from the black and white A Boy Meets Girl, which is so striking, and there's a scene, it's not, it's, it's a cinematography, it's the art direction as well, the black and white art direction is so spectacular, but then the color films are equally beautiful, the livers on the bridge is ravishing. How, how do you collaborate with the cinematographer? Does he give you a lot? Do you go to him with an idea and he says, that's possible, that's not possible? Let's try it this way. Do you do a lot of coverage just to s make sure it's going to work? Well, it's very different if you talk about film or digital. Um, yeah. I started with film, and so I was lucky when I was, you know, young to 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 meet this director of photography, Jean-Yves Escoffier, and he was ten years older, and he became my best friend and like a brother, and we made three films together. <coughs> so, the way you, the thing is before the shoot, that's that's when you rework. It's what sure. you know, the year before you start shooting, or the six months before you start shooting. So whatever you do with, um, like, you know, you look at photos, you take photos, you look at paintings, you talk. Mm -hmm. You know, we would smoke opium, go to the hammam, whatever we did, we were making the film already. Ah. But that I only experienced with this man. Uh, then I had different directors of photographies. I mean, he died, and I had different oh. um, experiences with different. And so, in a way, it was not so hard for me to go to digital because since I didn't have this man anymore, I felt it would anyway never be the same. So, right. um, in and digital, it's much poorer. I mean, film was so rich. <coughs> Uh, it's amazing that it's been abandoned. And that, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very strange story because it was you know, uh, digital is much poorer. Uh, <laughs> but people think it's richer because you can do anything, as I say, with it. You can, you know, you can shoot a, a scene in daylight and make it nighttime. You can do everything in post production, let's say. So, which makes people lazy. Yeah. Uh, Um, I didn't used to. Um, yeah, it's very strange because yeah, I use I, you know when how do you call it in English when you do the color you work on the color correction. 
A color correction. Color so correction, maybe. <coughs> so, of course, I don't see the same. But we nobody sees the same thing anyway, you know. So when you're talking about colors, I don't agree with the people who say, I see, you know, they contr there's more contrast with that, um, which is better for me. So it's, I have to adapt. Um, but without them, I don't see anything, so. <laughs> I'm wondering with digital, if, um, if it's less, let's say, less <coughs> precise visually. In a way, though, it, it, you make a different kind of movie. I mean, maybe you focus on, like, in Holy Motors, different propulsion. It's not, <coughs> it's not as fixed as a visual image, you know. Um, the plan, plan sequence is different, you know? Yeah. It's not as pictorial. I think, you know, the probably to the young people and to, to, to my daughter, who's small now, but in a few years, when she, <coughs> she won't understand what we're talking about, digital and film. Mm. All right. Um, I feel digital, I mean, I don't like to be nostalgic, so I'm, I'd rather be angry than nostalgic. So I decided to, to shoot in digital five years ago, and I probably won't make films in film anymore. But um, the essence of cinema is in film, not in digital, for sure. Right. And um, you know, when um, cinema is between images, you have dark, you have black. You know, cinema is blinking. You know, if we don't blink, if our eyes don't blink every minute, they get dry and you get blind. And that's what digital is for me. <laughs> well, we have a, there's a, um, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science Technology Branch is presenting a workshop here on Sunday, 4 o'clock, on <coughs> digital cinema, called The Digital Dilemma. So, for those of you interested in pursuing this with people who are probably pro more pro-digital than you might be worth <laughs> checking that out. Uh, <coughs> dude? Yeah. Between the lengthy intervals, uh, between uh, one film and another which you're making, in these days of recession, how do you finance yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, two th there are a few things. The first, um, I guess <coughs> I'm very lucky in a way because the French system is probably the most friendly system for filmmakers. So, you know, I still, each time in my films, you know, none of my films were box office success, but they all um, traveled in space and time. Um, like this year, they're release, re releasing my first films in America and in Asia. So I get money from that. I get money from that. Um, <coughs> the other thing is, I do other, th you know, I've, I've written a few songs, I've done a few video clips. I never did commercials, but I, I do a few things to get money sometimes. And I've worked on projects, I've been paid for them, even if I didn't make the films. Okay. So, of course, that's, that's the mysterious part. And yeah. that's why I make so few films, because I never know. <laughs> and it, each time it seems I'm never going to, you know, get inspired again. <coughs> you, and it's maddening, because you don't know where it comes from. Um, in this case, Holy Motors, clearly the rage I had about, you know, from not making films was important. As I said, it's better to be angry than nostalgic. So anger is very inspiring. Um, but then I have no idea how, where a film starts. I don't know. I'll tell you later. I'll think about <laughs> it. <laughs> I think I this girl know. has a future in board games. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, opinion about 3D? Have you seen any 3D movies? Um, House of Wax. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I'm, 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 
I, you know, is, I, it, is it something you would use <coughs> in your paint box, for example? I could. I, I'm, I'm not against any uh, technical right. invention. Um, <coughs> I don't like it until now. I don't feel it's sweet. I mean, I feel it's. The whole, I don't know. It doesn't feel organic yet at right. all. But why not try? Um, no, I would, yeah, I always wanted to make a superhero film, but I, the problem is like, I, I, I could never invent a, a, an interesting su superpower because they're very boring. The superpowers are usually he's strong and he can fly, that's it. Can, can uh -huh. you expect Mr. Murdy to be a superhero sometime? Maybe? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe a super troll? <laughs> 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 um, I think we seem to have covered a lot of... Frank, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.